NASA and the European Space Agency are planning an operation unlike anything we've ever seen. In a mission that stems from many years of research, mind-blowing feats of engineering, several epic failures, and lots of complicated math, humans plan to, for the first time ever, bring rock samples back from Mars to Earth for analysis. Sounds pretty simple, right? Send a couple of astronauts to get the rock samples, get in and get out, a quick smash and grab, and we just bring these sample bottles and whatever's in them back to Earth. If only. It's not that simple, and we'll show you why in just a few moments, so join us as we fit the pieces together and take a look at how humans plan to bring back the first ever Martian samples to Earth. Buckle up, it promises to be a wild ride. NASA and the European Space Agency are planning a mission that will be as significant as the moon landing was in 1969. The mission? Simple. Transport the samples collected from Mars' surface by the Perseverance rover back to Earth for detailed analysis. How hard can that be? Well, harder than you might think. And to give you an idea of what this mission entails, let's do a quick rundown of how NASA and the ESA plan to retrieve Perseverance's samples. The idea is that Perseverance, if still operating at that time, will carry the samples it's been collecting for years to an exact spot on the Martian surface, a sort of cache point, if you will. At the same time, the Sample Retrieval Lander, or the SRL, will be completing a long and potentially treacherous two-year journey from Earth to Mars. SRL's onboard helicopters, yes, I said helicopters, plural, will then carry the samples to the lander while they'll be transferred to a rocket. Yes, I said a rocket. This rocket will then launch from Mars' surface to intercept precisely with a spacecraft waiting for it just outside the planet's orbit, beginning another long and potentially treacherous journey back to Earth. And if all of that goes 100% according to plan, the sample container still has to survive being hurled at top speed through the Earth's atmosphere, hopefully landing fully intact in the middle of the Utah desert. Oh, and the sample tubes have to not contain some live Martian bacterial strain that will cause global contamination here on Earth. What could possibly go wrong? Well, before you freak out, let's slow down a bit and break down each of these steps one at a time. In one of our earlier videos, we discussed the Perseverance rover and its trip to the Jezero crater. We also discussed the significance of the Jezero crater on Mars. If you missed it, you'll definitely want to check it out. We explained that aside from being a large crater, scientists have always focused on the Jezero crater because it is thought to have once been filled with water and may have served as a water source for life that presumably existed on the red planet billions of years ago. That's right, proof of life on Mars. The search for the existence of life is the primary goal of the Perseverance mission and the sample retrieval mission as well. Before Perseverance even landed on the Martian surface, scientists were already anticipating what types of soil and rock they might find, with a particular interest in stromatolites. On Earth, stromatolites are thought to be the earliest and most primitive form of life. They are rocky formations created by communities of cyanobacteria, which are tiny, photosynthesizing organisms. Stromatolites formed when this specialized bacteria grew on top of layers of sedimentary particles, binding them layer upon layer until becoming mounds. If Perseverance is able to find something like stromatolites on Mars, then we would have proof that life did exist on the Red Planet. It is with this purpose in mind that Perseverance landed on Mars with 43 sterilized, finger-sized titanium tubes for holding various rock types. As of 2022, 14 of Perseverance's 43 tubes have already been filled with samples from seven different rock types. It is expected that by 2030, at least 38 of those tubes will be filled with more exciting samples from Mars. What about the remaining five tubes? They will be used as a control group 
to see if any contaminants are carried along with the samples. The Perseverance rover, although an engineering marvel, cannot analyze the samples it collects. For us to fully understand the samples and unravel any information they hold, the samples have to be analyzed on Earth. But we can't just send astronauts to go pick them up. While that would be a more straightforward approach, sending astronauts is out of the question until we figure out a way to successfully perform a crewed flight to Mars. So rather than use this astronaut approach, NASA came up with something else, which as you might have guessed, centers around our trusty Perseverance rover. For years, Perseverance has been collecting samples of every interesting rock type on Mars around the Jezero crater. Every time it finds a rock of interest, it collects two samples of that rock type. Why? The retrieval mission is extremely important. And while NASA and the ESA would love everything to go according to plan, history tells us that it's always wise to have a backup. So Perseverance will leave one of each sample at a specified drop point and carry the second of each sample in its belly. So what comes next? The Sample Retrieval Lander. The Sample Retrieval Lander is expected to arrive on the Martian surface by 2031. And believe it or not, the lander will carry a rocket called the Mars Ascent Vehicle, along with two Ingenuity-type helicopters to assist in completing its mission. It is expected that when the lander arrives, Perseverance will have completed its sample collection, and if it's still working, Perseverance will carry its samples directly to the lander for transport back to Earth. In the event that something has happened to Perseverance and the rover has ceased to function, it'll be time for the two onboard sample recovery helicopters to shine. These helicopters have been designed just like Ingenuity, except they have more wheels for easier maneuverability and gripping abilities for carrying samples. These helicopters will carry the cached samples from the cache point and load them onto the lander's rocket, the Mars Ascent Vehicle. The ESA's sample transfer arm will also be aboard the lander to load the sample tubes onto the Mars Ascent Vehicle for their return to Earth. Everything on Mars is a bit different, and launching a rocket on Mars couldn't be more dissimilar than how we do it on Earth. There will be no humans on Mars during the retrieval mission, so can you even imagine how this is going to work? No clue? We'll fill you in. The rocket, or Mars Ascent Vehicle, is 3 meters long and weighs only about 372 kilograms or 820 pounds on Mars. In order to launch it, the lander will have to throw the MAV several meters above itself, catapulting the rocket into the air. During the launch, the lander will fling the front of the rocket a little harder than the rear so that it points upwards towards the Martian sky. The rocket's solid propellant will then ignite in mid-air, firing the rocket at speeds of 8,950 meters or 29,364 feet per hour, just enough to escape Mars's gravity and get into space. At this point, you're probably thinking the hard bit is over. But remember, the MAV isn't capable of completing the long journey back to Earth by itself. This is where the ESA's Earth Return Orbiter comes into action. The Return Orbiter is set to launch in 2027 and will be ready and waiting just outside of Mars's orbit at the time of the MAV's launch. Think of the Return Orbiter as the getaway driver, rendezvousing with the MAV and its snatched samples so that they can speed off toward Earth, escaping with the hot goods before Mars even knows what's missing. The MAV will lock on to its getaway driver using a beacon. At this point, the nose of the rocket is all that will be left. It turns out that Mars will have caught on to the missing samples sooner than expected, and will never allow the rocket to escape its gravity unscathed. Nevertheless, once the remaining nose of the rocket gets into the orbiter, it'll be fitted with a protective covering and sent out to continue the long two-year trip home. By 2033, the MAV is expected to be visible in our night sky, successfully having completed the world's greatest heist. Well, 
That is if the heist doesn't end with the MAV crashing into the Earth's surface and exploding into bits. That would be the worst heist of all time. Billions of dollars and unrecoverable years of effort gone in a flash, and all those invaluable Martian rock samples lost forever. The Earth Return Orbiter and the MAV have no parachutes, so nothing is stopping them from entering the Earth at neck-breaking speed and blowing up into pieces upon hitting the Earth's surface. To prevent this horror from happening, Lockheed Martin is designing the Earth Entry System, or the EES, which has a simple yet critical job. Prevent the MAV and the samples it carries from blowing up into microscopic pieces. This EES will essentially provide a heat shield and protective casing so that the sample container can make a safe landing on the surface of the Earth. And that pretty much concludes the return mission. All that's left to do from there is transport the samples to a terrestrial lab, specifically designed to house the first extraterrestrial samples on Earth. In other words, scientists are planning to control for any potential global contamination. Or so we hope. It is believed that once on Earth, these samples will take us one step closer to answering questions that have haunted us since our creation. How did we come to exist? Why are we here? And does life exist on other planets? It will also lead to a whole new form of space exploration and will inspire future scientists and astrophysicists to reach heights we can't even fathom right now. What aspect of the retrieval mission sounds the most impossible to achieve? Let us know in the comments.